Welcome back new Darktable user. We are continuing our newbies guide to Darktable 4.2.0. In this episode, we're going to look at the light table view. Let's go. Hi and welcome to episode 125 of Understanding Darktable. As promised, today we are going to look at the light table view. This is where you do most of your library management type stuff. In the last episode, we covered the import dialog box, so there's no need to revisit that. Uh, but what we will do is look at all of the other modules in the light table view. First up, though, there are two buttons which you will see are common to all of the modules. The one on the left is your reset button. So if you've made any modifications within a module, you can simply hit that to reset the module to its default state. So if we were to look at the collections module, by default, it will always search film rolls, which is what Darktable calls a batch of images when you import them. But let's say I wanted to search by, let's say, ISO. And maybe I want to find all the images I've ever shot at 6400 ISO, for example. Right? So there's Darktable filtering all of the images I've ever shot at 6400. If I want to just get back to the default for collections, I hit the reset button and we're back to looking at my default catalog. Anything you see with a line through it like this simply means that those images are no longer in the location where Darktable knew them to be at the time that it became aware of those images. So either I've deleted the images or I've moved them somewhere else using the operating systems file manager. And so Darktable no longer knows where those images are. Same with these. All right, so we can hit reset once again, and we're back to the start. The other button is your preset manager. This will vary from module to module, but essentially most modules will have some sort of ability to save a preset. In the case of the collections module, you can store a new preset based on whatever search criteria you've used. And finally, on the left hand side, we've got the image information module. As the name suggests, this will give you information about any image that you hover over. So we can see the film roll that it was imported under, so 30th of December. The image ID and the group ID have always in my experience reflected the same number, so I'm not sure what the difference is between them. But I think that's a reference to the number of the import into your catalog. So, you know, for me, there's my last image, 77,855. I've got a lot of crap that I really need to delete off my system. We can then see the file name. We can see the full path. Uh, so that is the mount point on my system and the folder in which that image lives whether or not it's a local copy. There's a great video I did on that much earlier in this series that is still relevant. So go and check out that video on local copies if that interests you. Uh, all of the metadata that you could possibly imagine, if you've put tags, they will appear down there. So that is the image information module. Now I mentioned that each module has its own little hamburger menu and that many of these modules will have their own preferences. So. Click on Preferences and you will find that within the Image Information module, all of these options can be displayed or hidden. So if you're running on a monitor with limited resolution and that module is taking up too much screen real estate vertically on the left hand side of your monitor, you can come in and uncheck anything that is just not relevant to you. Uh, may maybe I'm not worried about export height and width, so I can save that. And as you can see, that has now condensed the size of the image information module. Over on the right hand side, we have some very handy modules. The first is the select module. As you can see, there is a button for select all that will select all images within whatever collection of images you are currently looking at. So if it's, you know, your entire catalog like this, then the select all button will actually select every single image that you've got in your catalog. You can select none. You can invert the selection. Uh, we can select the film roll that they were shot from, or we can select any images which have not yet been edited. Very handy. 
Next up, the selected images module. So you will notice within this group of images that there are a bunch of images that I've marked as rejects. They are the ones with the red X. I deliberately left them in my catalog for this exact moment in this video. So what I can do now is go up to my filter for all images, show rejected images only. I could then go select all that will select just those images. And then from the selected images module, I can select delete and trash. And that will physically delete those files from my file system. Do you really wish to physically delete 67 images? Yes, I do. They are now gone and I'm not seeing anything because I'm still filtering for rejected images only. I can now go back to looking at all images and now I've got the remainder of the images from my trip and all my rejects have been deleted. Uh, next up, you've got move, which will move the physical asset to another folder on your system. Copy will actually copy any physical asset. And when I say physical asset, I mean, you know, a raw file, a JPEG, a TIFF, a PNG, whatever it is, it will either move it to another folder or copy it to another folder. If you've shot a bracketed sequence with varying exposures, you can create an HDR by selecting the multiple images and create HDR. And that will then give you the option, I think, to save it in either DNG or EXR format. Duplicate will simply create a virtual copy of an image so that you can do multiple developments of that image. So you might say, I really like this image. I want to do a color version and I want to do a black and white version. So instead of having to do it once and then undo and then do the other version, you can create a duplicate and you can have your color version and your black and white version side by side on your system. But all you've done is added an extra two kilobyte file to your system that has all of the processing steps for each particular rendition. You can rotate clockwise, anti-clockwise, reset the rotation if you've forgotten what the default orientation was for the image, and then copy locally and resync local copy. As I mentioned earlier, I did a video on that much earlier in this series. Feel free to go and watch that because that is still relevant. That is not something that has changed. Uh, and then group, if we wanted to say, well, all of these uh, were shot in one sequence, I want those to be a group of images. I can click on group. You'll notice that they all get a little thumbnail to say they are part of a group. And the first image in the group has a slightly different little icon there. Up in the top right hand corner here, you'll see the collapse grouped images button that will simply hide all of the others in a stack under that top thumbnail. And I think there is a keystroke that will allow you to cycle through the thumbnails without actually expanding the group, but I can't remember. No, it's not the, it's not your arrow keys. It is there somewhere. If someone remembers what that is, please sing out in the comments. Click that again to expand the group. You can then ungroup. Next up, we've got the history stack. This will allow us to copy and paste development settings from one image to another image. I'm not going to go into this in full detail right now. You will probably work it out if you just spend five minutes playing with the module. Next up, we've got styles. This is where you can create a development style based on might just be some parameters in one module. It might be parameters that you've dialed in over a series of modules. So in this instance, uh, I've got a color balance RGB and a diffuse or sharpen module saved as a preset. Now to create a style, you find an image you've processed, you've got some modules in there that you like and you want to save that. So you click on the create button that will bring up the modules that were used for the processing of just that one image. And you might go, I really like what I did with these two graduated density filters to create a little bit of a, a darkening across the top and the bottom of the image. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to call it horizontal vignette for want of a better description. 
and you don't have to give it a description, but I'll go to by graduated, if I can learn to spell, density, filters, <laughs> and save. And so now I've got that horizontal vignette saved as a style. I could come over to an image like this one here and go horizontal vignette, apply, and that has applied that darkening to that image. Now, it doesn't look the same because there is other processing steps on this image that aren't on that image, and so that's why things look different. But what we have got, if we look at this, you'll see the two graduated density filters doing their thing to darken the top and the bottom of my frame. Next up, the metadata editor. Here you can create a title and a description for any image. You can also use that across multiple images if you like. Uh, if I was to come over here and call this Rainy Airport and apply, you will see in the image information module, title Rainy Airport. Within the metadata editor module, you do have some options for different licensing metadata for Creative Commons use. And as you can see, you can store presets with your own copyright information if you so desire. Next up, the tagging module. I did a complete video on this and I would highly recommend that if you want the nuts and bolts, go and check out that video. But this is where you can add keywords to any images that you want to add keywords to. I highly recommend adding keywords to everything, but that's me. Keywords can either be entered as individual items or you can enter them with a hierarchical nature, uh, which you can then choose to display or not display. Again, not going to go into all of that right now. Geotagging will allow you to do time offsets. Uh, I have mentioned in the past, you know, if you are shooting a wedding with another photographer, you get home at the end of the wedding and you import all of the images and you suddenly realize, oh man, my camera's one hour out of sync with his camera. You know, maybe we just went into or out of daylight saving and one of us hasn't changed the settings on our camera or whatever, you know. This will allow you to create a time offset for a group of images or a single image if you need to. And finally, we have the export module. This will allow you to take whatever processing you have done to an image and export it as a new file. Okay, next up, down the bottom, the film strip. This can be turned on and off with Control F, Command F if you're on the Mac. That will show you over the course of a year, month by month, how many images you shot. That's what this little skyline silhouette represents, is how many images were shot in each month. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what about prior to 2008? Well, I can just use the mouse wheel of my mouse to scroll the timeline forward and backwards. I can hold down the control key to zoom in on a particular year. So now I've zoomed in and I can see, you know, where I had big bursts of activity. If I want to create a very quick collection just based on a time range, I can left click and drag along this section of the film strip, and that will create a time-based collection. See here, it's gone to capture date, and it's included the dates that I covered when I dragged my mouse. Now, obviously, dragging your mouse along that timeline is not, or along that film strip, is not particularly accurate, but it's good enough for rock and roll, just to get you in the ballpark of what you're looking for. Next up, assigning color labels. If you want to assign color labels to an image or a group of images, select however many you want to apply. F1 will give you a red label. F2 will give you yellow. F3 will give you green. F4 will give you blue. F5 will give you purple. You can assign multiple colors to an image. You can have all five colors assigned to all of those images if that's what you really wanted. Don't know why you would do that, but you can. Likewise, to assign star ratings, you would use the keys above your QWERTY keys. So one for a one star, two for two stars, three for three stars. You get it. One will set it back to one star. And if you tap the one again, that will unrate. 
those images. Now there is an option in the preferences that if you don't like that behavior, you can turn that off so it won't unrate based on a second tap of the number one key. If you want to mark an image as a reject, press the R key. They will get their thumbnails grayed out, as you can see, and this red X applied in the bottom left of the thumbnail to signify that they are a reject. If I want to cancel that reject status, I simply go one and one again. Next up, overlays. You'll see that all of my images here have different bits of information. They have ARW for the raw file type. Uh, we've got the reject flag. We've got the star ratings. We've got color labels. All of that is an overlay. And we can turn those on or off via this star menu. And you'll see that there is a bunch of different options there. As for the size of your thumbnails, that is controlled via this slider here. So by default, I think it's something like nine per row, I think is the default value. Um, if you want it to be fewer and larger icons, then you can set that to a lower number. If you want, you can crank it all the way up to 25 thumbnails per row. But obviously, as you make your thumbnails bigger, then you have the ability to see more information down here at the bottom. And you'll notice that what information gets displayed here. And notice I'm on permanent extended overlays, will change depending on the size of the thumbnail. So at the moment I'm getting the file name, aperture, focal length, exposure, ISO, as well as star rating and reject, all of that showing up. But if I go to a smaller size, I don't see quite as much. That is controlled by a preference in the light table view here, delimiters for size categories. And that refers to the size in pixels at which how much or how little information is included with each thumbnail. So you can change that value to have when that amount of metadata displays or does not display change. All right, down here we have click to enter the film manager layout. So here we are looking at our film manager and it has a scroll bar on the side so that you can scroll up and down your collection. We can then go to the zoomable light table. This does not have scroll bars and you use your control button. I'm assuming that would be the command button on the Mac and your mouse wheel. And you can now zoom out and you can left click and drag the you know, gray area to just zoom the light table around. So if you are looking at a massive collection of images, so if I was looking at my entire collection here, I can just do click and drag to do zoomable light table. I personally prefer the file manager view. Next up, we have the culling layout. So you've got two different types of culling mode. You've got static, which you can enter with the X key. And this will just simply show you two images at a time. There is also a dynamic uh, culling mode, which allows you to see a whole collection of images. So if I was to go to something like my crocodile images here, I can select four images and then go into the dynamic culling mode and I can see all four and I could then mouse around and decide, okay, these are all one star. That's a one star, that's a one star and maybe this one is a three star, for example. And you can see there that the star ratings have been applied accordingly. If you want to see a full screen preview, you can simply click this icon here or press the F key and that will give you a full screen preview of the image. And one final thing that I do want to mention, and this is particularly for people who shoot in RAW, something that trips up new Darktable users all the time is that when you import your images into the light table, they will inherit the look of the in-camera JPEG. But the moment you open the RAW file in the darkroom view, the in-camera JPEG preview is discarded and you are simply working with the bland old RAW file in all its beautiful blandness. And that is not something 
you have any control over. That is just the way Darktable works. The expectation is that if you are shooting RAW and processing RAW, you want to start from the unprocessed image. Uh, we will talk about that more over the next couple of videos. All right, I'm going to leave it there for this episode. Uh, questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below, and I will catch you in the next one.